smart enough to turn that off yet. Uh, once I figure out how to turn that off, um, I will. I see Stephen is in North Ridgeville. That's correct. Okay, hopefully that'll be taken care of. Um, Caleb. Michael. Pardon me? Yeah, yeah. Vladislav. Kimberly. Ian. Nick. Nicholas. Tujuan. David Schneider. Here. Michael Ward. All right. Stephen, can you hear me? In North Ridgeville. Okay, all right, there we go. One thing I don't think I made clear necessarily is if you're in the online class, you can also sit in on the uh, campus lecture, if you wish. If you don't want to watch the YouTube video and you happen to be on campus or you have more questions or whatever, feel free to do that as well. I talked about sitting in on other labs, but I don't think I mentioned that sitting in on the lecture is also an option. I mean, we have plenty of seats here. Um, so you're welcome to come in. All right, what we want to do today is we want to sort of extend the example that we had last time and add to it to make it a completed web page. What we had last uh, class was really just a fragment of a web page. We, I wanted to go over tags and I wanted to talk about how we can tag things to make them behave differently. But we really didn't create a complete web page. We just did a handful of tags. So what I aim to do today is sort of to finish that out, flesh that out so that we may have a simple web page, but it'll be a complete web page. It won't be the, the fragment like we had last time. So let me download what I did last time. And let me review where stuff is found in Canvas for this class. Every week, the lectures and any materials you need will be in the module for that week. So if you go to modules, you will see the materials that you're to read, the handout. You'll see the lecture video. And you'll then see any examples I do in class. Now, one thing to keep in mind is I've had some people say that sometimes it's difficult to read the examples I give uh, in the video. And that's why I post the example, so that you can download the example, and so you don't have to try to read it off the video screen. You can, you can have the actual file there with you, and you can play with it, and you can make the same changes I do, and so on. So here we go. We have what we started last time called Rabbits. I'm going to click on it. And I'm going to download it. And I'm going to extract it. And there we are. We have a folder called Rabbits. And inside that is the page that I created last time. It's important to remember that when I upload my examples, I'm going to zip them up. I'm going to compress them. All right. Effectively, what that does is it makes the file size smaller. In addition, it combines everything into one file. That makes it easier to download. Now, the impact of that is that you have to decompress it, uncompress it, expand it, extract it for you to be able to see the individual files and to be able to work with them. So if you download the zip file and things aren't working right, a common mistake or a common thing that people forget is that you need to expand it. All right. Now, uh, before we get into editing um, the code, we're going to look at, notice that we see a little icon that indicates that this is an Internet Explorer file, so this is a web page. And we see the name of it is Rabbits. That's only partly true. The name of this file is rabbits.html. Right? The last part of any file name is called the extension. And that sort of identifies what kind of file it is. Now, for most typical users, 
most typical users aren't interested in learning like what file extensions mean what and so on. You know, for Word, a Word, a Word document um, is DOCX. Uh, and Excel is XLSX and so on down the line. Most people aren't really interested in that and just the names of them are enough. But we as developing web pages, we need to know in many cases the precise file name, the complete file name including the extension. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn on file extensions so that we can see the file extensions. And this is an important thing to do because sometimes similar files can have slightly different extensions. Images, for example. When we talk about images, many images uh, that we use are going to be JPEG files. Well, there's actually several different extensions that could be JPEG files. It could be JPG or JPEG or even a couple other. All right. So the idea here is we need to see the exact name so that when we create an image on our page, it gets the right file. So this varies with the kind of operating system you have. I think we're running Windows 7 on this machine, I think. But at any rate, if you go to Organize in Windows 7, Folder and Search Options, View, the little option here says Hide File ex Extensions for Known File Types. We're going to check that off and click OK. Then we see the full name for the file. We see the name of the file is rabbits.html, which is what we want. All right. That way, if I create another page and I want to link to this page, I'll know the exact name. All right. One thing that I alluded to last time, but I don't think I came out and said, is we're going to view our web pages two different ways. We're going to view them in a text editor, in our case, Notepad. All right. We're also going to view them in a browser. That's like the difference between taking a photograph of someone and taking an x-ray of someone. Right? Still just one person. You know, if I take your photograph, if I took an x-ray of you, there's still only one you. It's just a different way of looking at you. All right? When we view the web page in a browser, that's the way that people in the outside world are going to see the web page once it's finished and put out on the web. Because the browser is a piece of software used to browse the internet and to access and to read web pages. So when I open this up in the browser, for example, by double clicking it, this is what users would see if we put this page up on, on the web. We need, however, a way of getting in and, and, and changing the code and getting in and manipulating the nuts and bolts. And for that, that was, that's what we're going to use the text editor for. All right. Good. No. I don't think so. All right. <laughs> That's all right. Maybe he had a premonition. What if like what if like like in my class like Thursday I need assistance with it and it's like wow, he he's psychic. He knew in advance that. All right. Anyhow, we want to edit this. You can open it up any number of ways. We, I'm going to go in and I'm going to open up Notepad. And I'm going to go and click File, Open. Then I'm going to go navigate to that folder. It doesn't see it because we're only looking for text files or .txt files. So I'm going to click on All Files and now it sees my HTML file. And now I can go and open it and we can go in and start where we left off last time. A common mistake people make is when they go to save it, they save it as a TXT file and then it doesn't recognize it as being a web page. Yes? I found out that the text edit on Mac work just as fine as notepad and both oh. files can open the same way oh yeah a any any simple text editor will work um, in the labs they have something called notepad plus plus that has some nice features in it um, 
there's, there's any number of simple text editors that you can download even. Um, it, it really doesn't matter. The, the idea, though, is we want to write the code ourselves. We don't want to use like a graphical interface like a Dreamweaver or anything like that. We want to open up because we want to see the details of the code ourselves. All right. So to review what we did last time, we talked about the idea of tags. All right. And we talked about the idea that tags come in pairs. Starting tag looks like this. An ending tag looks like this. The stuff between them then, the tag defines how the browser is going to treat that. So the browser is going to treat this as a top level heading, which means that it makes it the biggest by default. It puts it on its own line and so on. H2, similar thing, but it's a little smaller. Later on in the class, we're going to learn how we can control exactly how the browser displays these. We could, for example, through CSS, which we'll talk about possibly later today, but more likely on Monday or, or Wednesday, through CSS, we could make it where H1s are the smallest heading. Now, why would you want to do that? You probably wouldn't, right? H1 means the top level. It's kind of like the most important. So you probably wouldn't want to make it smallest, but you could if you wanted to. The point is, is that the browser has certain defaults for these tags, and later on we're going to learn CSS where we can change those defaults and make it behave in a different way. So there are six levels of headers, H1 through H6. And again, it doesn't mean that this is the first, second, third. That's not why it's one, two, and three. Think of the levels of an outline. H1 is a top level. H2 is a level underneath that. H3 is a third level. So we could have multiple H2s. We got multiple H3s, and so on. You might wonder, gee, there's only six of them. Well, if you had a page that really had six levels on an outline, that would be a pretty detailed outline. All right. Um, and you might want to consider like breaking it up into two pages if you went beyond that. All right. Okay. The key thing with this is tags, starting and ending. This is the name of the tag that defines for the browser how to treat that particular thing. What I want to do now is I want to finish up this web page. It'll still be a simple page to be sure, but it'll be at least a complete simple page instead of a fragment of a simple page. And first thing we're going to do should be the first line of every web page, and that's a doc type. Whoops. Doc type is not really a tag. I think, strictly speaking, it's called a declaration. That tells the browser what it's dealing with. Because browsers can read a bunch of different kinds of files. They can read HTML, but they can read other files too. In addition, there's different versions of HTML, and I'm sure there will be more versions as time goes on. This tells the browser what it's dealing with. And, and in our case, this tells the browser we're dealing with an HTML5 file. All right. The doc types for HTML4 and previous were much more complicated than this. So I, I never remembered what they looked like. I, I looked it up every single time. All right. So gratefully, this is simple enough where we can remember it. All right. We then have an HTML tag. And then we have an end HTML tag. Now, this is getting to be, uh, we're going to get into now the, the concept of nesting tags. In other words, in the previous tags we used, the only thing we had between the starting and ending tag was some letters, some words. Now, between this tag and this tag, we have other tags. You can put tags inside other tags. So what this is saying is that my web page contains these tags. All right. You're defining a structure, if you will. There's two main sections of a web page, the head and the body. 
The head is information about the page, and the body is the actual bulk of the page, what you actually see in the window. So, I'm going to put the head. I'm going to give it a title. And then I'm going to give a body. All right. And that constitutes a minimal web page. A doc type, HTML tag, head and body, and then some other stuff. The title is what is going to appear up here in the title bar. So let's save this now, and let's view it again within the browser. So I'm going to go up and File, Save. Remember, when I originally saved it, I went and said File, Save, and I had to change file type text document to all files and then I typed in the name.html. So I'm going to go and save this. And I'm going to view it in the browser. It's really not going to look any different. But it is a complete web page. We followed the rules of HTML. By following the rules of HTML, you maximize your chance that the page will be uh, viewable and will be correct across browsers. All right. It's like the difference between having a paper which was a series of sentence fragments and having a paper where you have complete sentences and paragraphs and so on. You know, an introduction, a body, conclusion. It just puts it in the right form. Okay. Now I want to make a couple observations about this. Number one, notice that for well, number one is notice that I forgot the body tag or the end body tag. I'm sorry. That was easy for me to spot. As soon as I glanced over there, I saw that I was missing it. Why was I able to tell so quickly? Because of the way I in oh, go ahead. Because of the way I indented. You don't have to indent, but you indent to help you understand how the page is laid out and how the tags are nested. I literally could put this on one line going all the way across, and the browser would understand it. It's a computer, all right? However, the way that I've indented this is it allows me to see that this is an HTML document, has the head, has the body, this is the stuff that's in the head. This is the stuff that's in the body. All right. So you indent for your purposes so that you can easily see. And when we get into more involved structures, that's going to be very important because it's important for you to see like what is part of what. All right. If we look at this page again, a brief history or a brief introduction of rabbits, that, that's the title. That's up there in the title bar. All right. So don't confuse the title with the headings. The title appears up in the title bar. The headings appear on the body of the page. Notice in some cases, my starting tag and ending tag are on the same line. And in other cases, they're not. All right. That doesn't matter. You can structure it however makes sense to you. So in other words, what I have here whoops, this is equivalent to it. This is equivalent to what I had before. All right. The browser, in other words, you notice there's no difference visually between the two. The browser, in other words, 
takes all the white space on your, in your file and it converts it, it boils down to just a single space. It ignores any extra white space. So in other words, I could do this. Flemish giants and leave a gigantic gap between the two. Why would I want to? Well, I, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm doing it here just to demonstrate. And if I do that, the page is not going to look any different. See, looks the same. So you indent and you put blank lines in a way that will make the page easier for you to read. All right. One of the content, uh, uh, constants of all types of software development is that one of the most expensive parts of software development is going back and making changes to something that's completed. That's just, that's the way it's been since the first software was developed. All right. It sort of makes sense if you think about it, you know. It's like, what would it be more costly to do? Um, when you're planning a building or you're planning on building a house to while you're still sketching it on the architect's drawing board to decide to add another bathroom or wait until the house is finished and then add another bathroom. Well, when you're in the planning stages, it's much less costly to make changes while you're planning it and you're just dealing with sketches. Later on, when the, th the thing is completed, it's going to become more costly and more expensive to go in and modify it. The graph actually goes like this. Okay, let's see if we have problems with the dot cam. No, we don't. The graph goes like this. In other words, this is the phase of the project that you find a problem that you need to correct. And this is the cost of correcting it. The idea here is the further along you get in the project, the more expensive it becomes to correct a problem. And notice that, those of you that are mathematically inclined, this isn't a straight line. This isn't an arithmetic progression. This is a geometric progression. So there's a positive first derivative. That's all I remember from my calculus class. All right. So it increases at an increasing rate. All right. Now, much of what we do in terms of software development is try to flatten this out as much as we can. So if I say it's good practice to format your page so it's readable, what we're doing is we're making it easy to, easier to change. So hopefully it won't be that hard to figure out compared to if it was just one line going across. Again, the browser doesn't care. It's a machine. It can process a giant line of, one line of characters as easily as it can process many lines. But us as humans can benefit from dividing it in a way that makes sense and is logical to us. So we do things like putting in white space or putting tags on one line when it makes sense or putting tags on multiple lines when that makes sense. All right? Any questions? So far. I have a question with regard to the reading. Acceptable to use tag and element interchangeably in terms of the vocabulary? Uh, um, yeah, I suppose. Oh, I see. Um, I think the difference is that, that there are some things that are elements that aren't tags. Like, for example, this is an element of the page and it's not a tag the contents of a tag. Um, but yeah, for all, all purposes, element, tag, I, I kind of tend to use them synonymously. All right. Any other questions about this up to this point? Yes. Yes, you should. Um, you, you actually should, uh, and again, just for purposes of simplification, 
Um, I omit that, but um, strictly speaking, you should put the language in there on as part of the HTML tag, right? Lang equals en, right? All right. So you should do that to identify that. Remember, what you're doing when you're creating these files is you're helping any machine that reads your code, all right, process it correctly. So for example, if I put the language attribute in my page, then Google Chrome can be smart enough to ask to translate it if it's different than the owner of the machine's language. So if this was in French, for example, and I put language equals FR, then Google Chrome would notice that, hey, this is in French. Do you want to translate it into English? All right. Or if I do a search and search for pages and I only want to see pages, I do an advanced search and I only want to see pages that are French, I can select that. So yeah, this is, and again, I'm glad this came up today because this is why you read the book and listen to lectures that you pick up all this additional stuff. Yes? Do you want to do the... No. No. You only need to put that at the beginning. All right? Um, things like this, and we'll see more of these coming up soon when we get the links and images. This is called an attribute. All right? An attribute is extra information about a tag. This is an HTML document, and oh, by the way, its language is English. It would be like me saying, go out, you know, could you help me out and go to my car and get the box of stuff that's in my car? Well, there's a lot of cars out in the parking lot. Which one is mine? Well, I might give a description of it. It's the one that's this color, or this is a license plate, or whatever. So giving some additional information about something. And you use attributes for that. Attributes are only put on the starting tag. Um, you don't need to put them on the ending tag as well. So any attributes that we cover will only go on the starting tag and not in the ending tag. All of these tags are what are called block tags. I'm not sure when we hit our first inline tag, um, but these are block tags, which means that by default, they stack up on top of each other. They each get put on their own line. All right? Inline tags get put side by side. All right. We're going to cover a couple other tags, all right, and one of them is a paragraph tag. And it has a start P and an end P that says here's the beginning of the paragraph, here's the end of the paragraph. I'm going to go borrow from Wikipedia a couple paragraphs about rabbits. And they're going, of course they're going to hit me up for money. I'm going to go copy this. Paste it in here. I'm going to put a paragraph underneath it that says from Wikipedia. Again, we talked about this last time. I, um, just like I would in a term paper or whatever, I would give credit to the source of that. So. Notice that the text is all on one giant line going across. If I save it, it 
there's some goofy characters in there. All right. Notice that the browser itself is smart enough to wrap it around in the paragraph. And the browser also is smart enough, if I make this smaller, it'll wrap the paragraph around. All right. Actually, I put that in the wrong place. Let me go and move that. In fact, I'm going to go at the very bottom and put another H1 for credits. And I'm going to say all text from Wikipedia. That way I'm indicating where I'm getting all the text from this. All right. So there we have our two H1s because they're both considered equally important. And I have my paragraph here. Paragraph is also a block tag. So in other words, if I have a second paragraph, they are going to They're going to stack vertically. So paragraph, paragraph. Now notice getting back to the formatting of this, notice that the paragraph indeed is just one line. It doesn't matter how it is. I can format it in a way that makes it more readable. So I can go and do this. I think this is a character that is causing it grief. Wait, wait a minute. Pikas? Is that as in like Pikachu? No. If I was more interested, I will. I, I might. I might during lab. All right, so it doesn't matter how I format this. I can do it in a way that makes it readable for me, all right? It was one line and it displayed that way. I can make a... I'm going to go in and get rid of that problem by saying Unicode as simply a character set that includes more characters like the um, accents and things like that. So there we go. And notice that it doesn't really look any different even though I put stuff on its own line. Questions about this? Yes? Okay, what if you wanted it indented? All right. This is going to be a rule that you're going to hear a thousand times in this class, all right? The way your page looks depends on two things, all right? Two things. The first thing 
is the browser defaults of how the browser by default treats something. So if you don't do anything to change it, this is how paragraphs are going to look. No indentation, or actually a tiny, tiny bit of indentation. Notice there's a little bit of space there. To change any other aspect of the default browser behavior for something, we are going to use CSS. So right now you could answer a lot of questions, even if you don't know the precise answer. How could I change the color of the text? Well, the browser has a default. To change the default, you use CSS. How do I make a different font? Use CSS. How do I make a different color background? Use CSS. How do I put a border around it? Use CSS, and so on. So as we get into later on in the class, we'll see how we can go and we can take these defaults that the browser has for displaying these certain elements and change those around. All right? OK. Now, I could have a list of the different breeds here, all right, and I have that. But in some cases, it's nice to have a bulleted list, all right, on a web page. Especially keeping in mind that, again, you'll get a little bit difference of opinions on this, but for the most part, people like to scan web pages as opposed to reading every single word, all right, in many cases, anyhow. You want to get to the information that you want to. Typically, people don't necessarily read pages uh, on a website the way that they read, like pages in a book for enjoyment. They're, they're gathered, you know, they're, they're geared towards getting the answer to something. So what they have here is interesting. This is like a little mini table of contents, all right? And it's numbered. This is what is called a list, okay? And we're, we're going to use list a couple of places here on this page. I'm going to put a list under breeds to show a list of the breeds, all right? I'm going to start off my list with a UL and an NUL. UL stands for unordered list. There's a second kind of list called OL, which stands for ordered list. We'll see the difference in a minute. An unordered list is a bulleted list. It's where you have the list in an order that is kind of arbitrary. In other words, why did I pick Flemish giants to appear before dwarfs? I don't know. That was the order I thought of them in. All right. So there's really no rhyme or reason to the order. So it's essentially unordered. Lists consist of a series of line items, or list items, rather. Let's add let's add pikas on here too. Because I lied, I am very interested in <laughs> in what exactly a pika is. Okay. And then I'll go and add yeah, there I'll go. I'll go like this. All right. So now let's view this. I'll save that, and I'll go here and hit refresh, and I have a bracket that's turned the wrong way. That's interesting, all right? And that brings up a good point that we'll spend a few minutes on. 
What happens if you break the rules? Well, it depends. Maybe this is a bad example because I shouldn't encourage like bad driving habits, but what if you're going 26 in a 25 mile an hour zone? Well, probably you might get away with it, right? Or you might have an officer that has a new radar gun and is in uh, a crabby mood and might pull you over and give you a ticket for that, all right? That'd be probably pretty extreme, but you get the idea. If you break the rules in HTML, the consequences range from nothing to disaster. All right? Now, disaster is a, disaster's a, a strong word. I mean, you, it's not like your computer is going to blow up or anything. All right? Your web page just won't display. And it doesn't take much more than a violating a simple rule to cause a, quote, disaster. And we'll see that in a minute here. In this case, what did I do? Well, I used the wrong kind of bracket for my ending tag. So what did the browser do? Well, it doesn't know what this is. So it thinks it's just plain old text. So it just displayed that exactly as it is. It just thinks that I wanted to do that. So it puts that like that. So now I don't have an ending tag for this. But guess what? The browser forgave me. And it said, OK, you started a new list item, so I guess you were done with the old list item, is essentially what the browser said to itself. Not that browsers talk to themselves, but you get the idea. All right. And if I correct this, then everything's back to normal. All right. But if I forget the ending tag, everything's still back to normal. It's only when I get the ending tag wrong that I had something that was goofy. So there was a, quote, mistake that didn't really cause any problems at all. Now, watch this one, and let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. I'm going to, I, I should have turned the projector off for a second. I'm going to misspell the word title in the ending tag. You know, I'm typing and I, I mistype it. I type a couple E's in there. Disaster. Absolutely nothing. I do not see anything. And this happens typically once per semester, or once or twice per, per semester. Someone panics in lab. So I could like not mention this class and have a little giggle when people panic in lab, you know, because their web page that they worked on for hours all of a sudden just completely disappeared and let them sweat for a while. But I'm not a mean person, all right? So I'm warning you about this in advance. Let's try to pretend that we're the browser and figure out what the browser was, quote, thinking. What's the browser thinking here? Thinking, here's the start of the title. Everything from here until I hit the end title tag is part of the title, right? So let's go on, a brief introduction to rabbits. Yeah, that's part of the title. It gets to here and says, Oh, well, I'm not really sure what that is, but that's not an end title tag, right? It's spelled wrong. That's not an end title. That's something else. So I must still be part of the title. So it continues down looking for that end title tag until it hits the end of the page without having found it. And therefore, it thinks effectively the entire page is a title and it never got around to finding the end title tag, so it's not even sure what the title should be. So it kind of just says, well, here you go. All right. So the good news is one little mistake can potentially cause um, bigger sort of disasters to happen. And the good news, then, of that is that it's easy to correct. All right. 
So I put that back to the end title tag correctly and my page mysteriously reappears. I mentioned that there's another kind of list, an ordered list. Let's say the order did matter. Like I wasn't just, I just didn't pick them in some order. I picked them in the order of popularity. You know, um, the most rabbits that are kept as pets are this kind and the second most are this kind. I can use an ordered list then. And the only difference between an ordered list is that instead of a UL, you use an OL. And then instead of the bullet points, you see a one, two, and three. This one, it kind of makes more sense to consider it an unordered list because there really is no real order to it. It's just sort of the order I thought of things. So therefore, I'll keep it as an unordered list. Now, one last thing for today that is mentioned in the assignment. I talk about having an article for each section. There's a tag that you can use to group stuff together. That is called the article tag. Now, I could have considered this whole page one article, which is what I did here, because I put one article tag. I could have considered maybe the introduction as one article, about the breeds as a second article, about what the feed them is the third article. All right? But I didn't. All right? Don't sweat that detail. All right. In other words, there's a couple of reasonable ways that you could consider this. You could consider it one article or three articles. All right. For your assignment, I said have an article for each one of them, so you'll have three articles. But truth be told, you could do it with just one article if you wanted to. An article is simply a way of dividing your page into sections. It's new with HTML5. All right, we didn't have articles before HTML5. With HTML5, we got a whole set of tags that allow us to group stuff together into like a logical unit. An article is one example. A section is another example. A, head uh, a header, rather, is a third example. Nav is a fourth example. And we'll cover these uh, on Monday. All right. When we look at the page, we're not going to see any difference. Well, who cares then? Why do we do this? Well, it helps the browser understand the structure of the page. And it also gives us some of the ability to style the page in a certain way. So we can make our navigation look different than the text of the article. So if I go and save this, not really going to look any different. But it's a, quote, better page. Because we now have the ability to style things a different way. And we told the browser a little more about the way that this information is structured. Any questions about this? Yes? Absolutely. I think it is. Again, how you do it is your business, but as was observed, the minute I type in a starting tag, I type in the ending tag. Why do I do that? Because otherwise I will forget to go and close it. All right? And, and so it's a good practice. As soon as you put the one in, you know you have to put the other one in, so you might as well go and do it. Now, any of you that have done web development before, prior to HTML5, instead of article and nav and header, you just had one tag, and that was the div tag. And the, the issue with the div tag is that it really didn't give the browser any good information about what the contents of the data was. 
All right, it just says, hey, this is a division of the page. This is a part, a section of the page. Whereas here, we're defining it's a section, but what kind of section it is. Monday, we will cover the other kinds of parts of the page besides um, article. They're, call, they're called the, the structural tags that define the structure of a page. And then we'll get into links, and then we'll probably get into CSS on Monday. All right. Um, are you going to lab in North Ridgeville? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. We'll see the rest of you folks in lab upstairs.